on today's episode. I would like Sir Gawain for my husband. <laughs> Three of the young women fainted dead away. I mean, just imagine walking into your kitchen one morning and a Pop-Tart jumps up out of the toaster, puts you in a full Nelson, pile drives you into the linoleum. All kinds of tales. From all kinds of tellers. Here on The Appleseed. It's time for The Appleseed. In each episode of the show, we bring you a couple of stories from favorite storytellers. They'll entertain you, they'll inspire you, they'll get you thinking, and they'll even help your family tell your own stories. I'm Sam Payne, your host, and our first story is from Philadelphia storyteller Ed Stivender with a tale from the legends of King Arthur, the British king who with his knights of the round table bring to England a period of romance, chivalry, and honor. The Arthurian legends are a whole mythology of regal men and women in conflict with monsters and all kinds of medieval weirdness. And those adventures impart social values of the time to the people who heard them. And this particular story combines aspects of several stories, which was the nature of the legends themselves, kind of drawing on different sources and stories to create something fascinating and new. If you're a fan of the legends of King Arthur, this is a story for you. If you've ever tried to solve a tricky riddle, this is a story for you. And if you've ever discovered a perplexing secret, this is a story for you. Here's Ed Stivender with The Legend of Sir Gawain and Lady Ragnall, recorded live in the Appleseed Studio. King Arthur was riding back toward Camelot. It was almost Christmas, and it was his custom at the Christmas season to meet with the knights of the round table, and there around that great table to tell the stories of what had happened the year before, what dragon they had slain, what Turkish knight they had vanquished, what damsel in distress they had rescued. Arthur had sent his squire on ahead to warn the castle of his homecoming. As he neared the glen by the green chapel, a place thought to be inhabited by demons and wizards, he heard his name called out. Arthur, king of the Britons. He peered into the glen, but could see no shape of any mortal man. Again the voice, Arthur, king of the Britons. He dismounted, walked into the glen, and there, as his eyes became accustomed to the light, he saw a giant of a knight, clad all in green armor, from his helmet to his shoes, and in one hand the great knight held an axe the blade of which was an L-rod long and sharp as any razor. Arthur, if thou art as brave as thy brave knights say, thou wilt stand against me in some Christmas sport. What sport is that, Sir Knight? The beheading game. <laughs> One strike apiece, and you may strike the first blow. The knight handed the axe to Arthur. Then the knight knelt upon the ground, took his helmet off his head, bared his neck, and leaned over. Arthur, his honor at stake, brought the axe down upon the knight's neck with such force that the head severed from the body and rolled across the glen. But the body did not fall. Instead, it picked itself up dusted itself off, walked over to its grisly head, placed it back upon its grisly shoulders, and laughed a grisly cry. Ha, 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 ha. My turn. Now the knight took the axe. Arthur, his honor at stake, knelt upon the ground, took his helmet off his head, bared his neck, leaned over, and listened as the axe whistled through the air, but stopped before it touched his neck. Ha, 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 Arthur. Thou art too easy a prey. Rise, I'll give thee respite and a riddle. If thou canst solve the riddle in a year, I'll spare thy life. If thou canst not, I'll have thy head. What is thy riddle, Sir Knight? The riddle is this. Of all that can be won or lost, what does a woman want most? Arthur remounted his steed, rode towards Camelot. 
When the sentry spied him, he sounded the trumpet, and all of the knights and ladies of the court came to the tops of the parapets and cheered the king's homecoming. Across the drawbridge, Arthur stabled his horse, and then he went into the room of the round table where all of the knights were waiting to tell their stories. What dragon they had slain, what Turkish knight they had vanquished, what damsel in distress they had rescued. When it came round to Arthur, he too told the story of meeting the strange knight in the glen. And now, ladies of the court, I need your help. Of all that can be won or lost, what does a woman want most? First, he turned to Queen Guinevere, his wife. The queen looked up at Arthur and said, Oh, my liege, there is nothing that I would want except what you would have for me. This was a very long time ago. <laughs> Each of the women betrothed or married to a knight gave that self-same answer that they would want nothing except what their husbands had for them. When it came to the unmarried, unattached women, they had more creative answers. Some said land, some said jewels, some said Sir Gawain. For Sir Gawain was the handsomest and noblest of all of Arthur's knights. And yet after every woman had spoken, he knew that he did not have the true answer within him, for his heart did not burn. And so he said, I shall go throughout my kingdoms, England, Ireland, Brittany, France, and ask every woman that I meet the answer to the riddle until I find the one that burns my heart within me. And so for a year he went from pillar to post, from castle to hamlet to village, asking every woman that he met the answer to the riddle. But it was a year later that he returned to the glen by the green chapel, none the wiser, for he did not have the answer that burned his heart within him. As he approached the glen, he heard his name called out uh, with a different voice. Arthur, king of the Britons. <laughs> he turned, and there, sitting below a tree, was the most disgusting hag he had ever seen. Her hair was all matted, and spiders ran in and out of it. Instead of teeth, she had two tusks, one that went down, one that went up. Her clothing stuck to her skin from the running sores thereon. The stench of the woman was worse than any stable, and there was liquid dripping from every opening in her face. <laughs> Arthur, hast thou got the answer to thy riddle? No, I've asked every woman, uh, <clears throat> almost every woman in the kingdom, but I do not have the one that burns my heart within me. If I give thee the answer, wilt thou give me whatever it is I ask? Yes, lady, if you can save my life, I will give you whatever it is you ask. Very well, Arthur. The answer is this. Of all that can be won or lost, what a woman wants most is sovereignty, the right to choose her own destiny, to decide for herself, to be under the will of no one but that of God. When Arthur heard this answer, his heart blazed within him. He walked into the glen by the green chapel, and there the knight was waiting. Arthur, hast thou got the answer to my riddle? Of all that can be won or lost, what a woman wants most is sovereignty, the right to choose her own destiny, to decide for herself, to be under the will of no one but that of God. When the green knight heard this answer, he cried a grisly cry, disappeared in a puff of smoke. Arthur remounted his steed and began to ride towards Camelot when he heard behind him, Arthur, <laughs> art thou not forgetting something? <laughs> he wheeled the horse about, went back, to the hag, helped her upon the saddle, and taking the bridle as though he were a common squire, Arthur, king of all the Britons, walked to Camelot. <laughs> when the sentry spied him, he sounded the trumpet. All of the knights and ladies of the court came to the tops of the parapets and cheered the king's homecoming, but their cheers turned to cries of dismay when they saw the unseemly guest across the drawbridge. Arthur helped the lady down from the horse, and then with the lady on his arm, walked her into the room of the round table and seated her next to him, where no knight would speak until Arthur had explained the strange guest. 
and he did so, explaining how the lady had saved his life that very day. And now, lady, I have promised to give you whatever it is you ask. What might that be? I would like Sir Gawain for my husband. <laughs> Three of the young women fainted dead away. <laughs> Sir Gawain, handsomest and noblest of all the knights, rose from his chair, went over to the lady, genuflected before her. Lady, it would be my honor if you would be my bride. Oh, Gawain, the pleasure will be mine. <laughs> and so that very afternoon, Sir Gawain, handsomest and noblest of all the knights, and the hag Ragnell were married. And so it was, as the sun was setting, he led his lady up the staircase to the bridal chamber, lifted her across the threshold, placed her on the bed, turned round to close the door, and when he faced the bed again, the disgusting hag was gone, and in her place a woman more beautiful than Gawain had ever seen. What magic is this? Tis a strange magic, my lord. Where is my wife? I am your wife. No, the hag, uh, the lady... <laughs> The Lady Ragnell is my wife. Gawain, I am the Lady Ragnell. I've been cast under a spell. Half the time I am, as you saw me today, a disgusting hag. The other half the time I am, as I truly am, as you see me now. And now, Gawain, you must decide. Which would you rather have? A wife disgusting in the day and beautiful at night, or beautiful in the day and disgusting at night? Hmm... Gawain searched his heart, and when he had decided, he faced the woman again and said, Lady, I choose that you decide for yourself. When he said this, the woman's face broke into a smile. Tears came running down her cheeks. Gawain, thou hast done it. Thou hast given me what every woman wants most, the sovereignty, the right to choose her own destiny. And indeed, the spell was broken, and hag she was no more. And that night, the couple surrendered their sovereignty to one another. And if the English language had words to describe the joy and ecstasy of that night, the story would be much longer. <laughs> but, alas... Ed Stivender with The Legend of Sir Gawain and Lady Ragnall, a story recorded live in the Appleseed studio before our terrific studio audience. That story discusses kind of an important idea about the responsibility that comes with sovereignty or what we might call the freedom to choose or autonomy or self-governance. You know, once you're free to choose for yourself in big and small decisions, you find you have to be responsible for your actions. And sometimes that realization can kind of paralyze us, but that's at least partly what growing up is about. Listening to that story made me remember when I was a little kid when we would sometimes go out for fast food. My parents always ordered for us a regular hamburger, small fries, and a small root beer. Always. Never a variation from that formula. Regular hamburger, small fries, and a small root beer. Then, when I was about nine, I was out of town on a trip with my dad, just him and me, and our car broke down. And while it was being fixed, we waited in a burger place across the street from the car repair place. And we sat down at a little table together. My dad wasn't hungry, but wondered if I was. And when I said I wasn't hungry, but I was thirsty, he told me I could go to the counter and order whatever I wanted total sovereignty. It was the first time I had ever ordered anything on my own. And the girl behind the counter asked what size drink I wanted, and it stopped me in my tracks. I'd never had anything but a small root beer before. And I was so flummoxed by my freedom that I couldn't decide. In fact, I said to the girl behind the counter, um, it doesn't matter what size, whatever size you want. <laughs> but no, she was going to make me decide. In fact, the place had kind of come to a standstill while I decided. And it seemed a Herculean feat, but I finally did decide on a medium 
lemonade. It made me realize that with sovereignty comes the responsibility to decide for yourself and to pursue what you decide. And as I learned at the fast food place when I was nine, it's not always that easy. Stories have this wonderful way of sprouting like seeds and growing as the stories bring up thoughts and memories that grow into conversations. Maybe that's why we call the show The Apple Seed. Coming up, a story from Bill Lepp, a tall tale about a West Virginia preacher in the wilds of the California forests. That's up next on The Apple Seed. I'm Sam Payne. It's such a pleasure to be with you on the apple seed. A moment ago, we heard the legend of Sir Gawain and Lady Ragnall from storyteller Ed Stivender, a story about offering to someone what you may take for granted. And we have another story today, a tall tale from West Virginia storyteller Bill Lepp about confrontation and resolution in the most tongue-in-cheek tone possible. It's also about mountain lions, pop-tarts, and, say, theological fragility. Here's a performance of a story called The Ojai Mountain Lion, recorded live in the Appleseed Studio. I was doing a storytelling festival in Ojai, California. And Ojai, if you don't know, is about 13 miles inland from Ventura Beach, sits about 800 feet up above sea level. If you do know, don't contradict me. <laughs> I was staying in a little cabin, and behind my cabin there were several thousand acres of land that a local nature conservancy had purchased. And I got up one morning and decided to take a hike. And when I got to the parking area, there was a notice board. And in the middle of that notice board, there was an 8x10 computer printout with a color picture of a very ferocious-looking mountain lion on it. And the sign said, warning, mountain lions have been spotted in this area. Well, I am from Charleston, West Virginia. We do not have a lot of mountain lions in Charleston, West Virginia. So I took this more as a precursor to an adventure than an actual <laughs> one. And the sign went on to say what you should do if you encounter a mountain lion. And the first thing it said you're supposed to do is to try and look as big as possible. <laughs> I just don't have a lot of big working for me. And then it said you should stare the mountain lion in the eyes and back away as slowly as possible. And the third thing it said to do, it said if the mountain lion attacks, and I thought this was particularly prudent, it said if the mountain lion attacks, fight back. <laughs> And then you could tell somebody's mother had written the sign because the last thing it said was, do not hike alone. Well, I didn't have anybody with me, so I started hiking. And um, <laughs> also, I thought this was just some sort of anomalous case of the government giving me good advice. But I was at Mount St. Helens one time, and they were having ash plumes. I'm saying the word A-S-H, plumes. And, that, and, and so the sign said, in the event of an ash plume... Go inside. If you cannot go inside, get in your car. If you can't get in your car, try not to breathe ash. <laughs> so anyway, I started hiking, and I came around a curve in the path, and there, standing in the middle of the path, with his claws out and his fangs bared, was the biggest, meanest, ugliest, nastiest chipmunk that I had ever seen. But right behind him, with his claws out and his fangs bared, was the biggest, meanest, ugliest, nastiest mountain lion I had ever seen, and both of them were pretty happy to see me. Because <laughs> that chipmunk knew that he wasn't going to be breakfast anymore. And that mountain lion knew that he was going to get a lot more to eat than he had been planning on. So the first thing that happened was that chipmunk shot off into the underbrush. So there I was, staring eye to eye with a hungry mountain lion. Well, I knew that I was supposed to try and look as big as possible, but that seemed counterproductive to me. So I just sort of turned sideways, sucked in my gut, and pulled up my T-shirt. I wanted that mountain lion to see my ribs. I wanted him to think that I was the breakfast equivalent of a Pop-Tart. 
a pre-wrapped pastry, not worth going to any trouble for. But apparently, that's exactly what he was in the mood for, because he crouched down and got ready to spring. Well, it was way too late to start backing away. So I realized I was going to have to fight this mountain lion. Now, I don't know about you, but I had never fought a mountain lion before. And the only thing I could think to do is what Tarzan does in Edgar Rice Burroughs' novels when he fights lions. And what Tarzan does is he crouches down like this. And when the lion springs, Tarzan gets up under his front legs, turns him around, puts him in a full Nelson, and knocks him out. <laughs> it wasn't much, but it was all I had. <laughs> And I know you're probably thinking, Tarzan's a lot bigger than you, buddy. But then I figure that Africa lions are a lot bigger than California lions. So I was hoping the ratio would work out, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. You're with me on this one. So I crouched down. And uh, just before the lion sprang, I reached in my pocket. And I pulled out my stainless steel 74 function Swiss Army type knife. Now, I didn't have any time to open up any of the blades. But I had it in my hand. <laughs> And when the mountain lion sprang, I got up under his front legs, I turned him around, I put him in a full Nelson, and I was doing everything I could to knock him out. Uh, but it wasn't quite working. And to be honest with you, that mountain lion was pretty angry. But he was a lot more embarrassed than he was angry. I mean, just imagine walking into your kitchen one morning, and a Pop-Tart jumps up out of the toaster, puts you in a full Nelson... Pile drives you into the linoleum. <laughs> it didn't help matters that there was a chipmunk standing beside the path going, na 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 na. <sighs> but that mountain lion was growing steadily less and less embarrassed and more and more angry. I was still doing everything I could to knock him out, and nothing was working. And, and that's when I remembered that I had been a pastor for four years. And I thought, what I ought to do is I ought to preach to this mountain lion. Because I knew from 200 Sundays in the pulpit experience that a lot of times if you preach to somebody, one of two things will happen. You'll either save them or you'll put them to sleep. <laughs> either alternative seemed all right to me. So just before I started my sermon, what I did was, I'm a pocket knife there, I opened up, it's got a couple of special blades. Uh, it's got a copy of the New Testament on it, and then... <laughs> It's got some vestments, because it's not just a Swiss Army knife. It's also a Salvation Army knife. <laughs> I know. Thank you. It's a long way to go for that joke, but I think it's worth it. Um, <laughs> so I laid into that mountain lion. Uh, I, I started into my sermon. I gave him some Samson. I gave him some Daniel. I was coming around the corner into Nero when I looked down and... <laughs> Sure enough, he was sound asleep, but I still didn't know what to do with him because I was afraid if I just laid him down, he might wake right back up. But more than that, he'd only had about five minutes of the word. So he was in a very fragile theological condition. <laughs> I was out in California. Who knew who the next person down the path was going to be? You know, it could have been a guy in black pants and a white shirt, little name tag. So... <laughs> couldn't have that on my conscience. So, I decided what I ought to do is I ought to baptize that mountain lion. Because again, I know from vast experience that a lot of times if you baptize somebody, you will never see them again. So, I got him up on my hip. And I started making my way down towards the edge of the Ventura River. I got right to the edge of the river, got ready to baptize that mountain lion. But that's when it occurred to me, I didn't know what denomination he was. Now, I'm a Methodist, so we sprinkle. But I figure anybody that got converted as quickly as that mountain lion did almost had to be a Baptist. So that meant... I was going to have to go for the full board Duncan there. And I asked, I asked my dad when I was a kid, how come Methodists just get sprinkled, but Baptists get the full board Duncan? And dad told me that that's because Methodists just have dirty minds. <laughs> but that the Baptists are dirty all over. So, 
So I got the mountain lion up on my hip, and I started making my way into the Ventura River, and I said the words you're supposed to say, and then boom. And when we came back up out of the water, that mountain lion was angrier than he had been all day. Didn't seem at all like someone who had just experienced the peace of Christ in his life. <laughs> and that's when it occurred to me that mountain lions are cats, which means they have nine lives, which probably means that they have nine souls, which meant that I was going to have to baptize that mountain lion eight more times. <laughs> I was coming up out of the water on about the seventh turn when I looked up and I saw, standing on the bank of the river, an angelic figure. She had her back to the sun, and the sunlight was dappling through. She had long, flowing hair. Sunlight was kind of dappling through kind of a halo over her head. And then I heard a most unangelic voice that said, Unhand that mountain lion. <laughs> And she turned, I could see it was a woman, and she was wearing the uniform of a member of the California Department of Natural Resources. <laughs> and she said, don't you know that it's illegal in the state of California to push your religion on a wild animal? <laughs> and she reached in her back pocket and pulled out her wallet and she flipped it open. It had her badge in it. And about 16 of those little plastic card carrying cards thing had like her Vegans Anonymous card in her... <laughs> herbal tea drinkers of America card and a people for the non-proliferation of human religions amongst animals card and then all the way down at the bottom there were some ashes that I'm pretty sure were from the bra that she had burned in 1968 she said I want you to release that mountain lion into my protective custody at this moment and I swear to you that mountain lion turned and looked at me and he said, don't let her protect me. So he and I worked out a quick deal. I let go of him. He went one way, I went the other way. And there's no real end to this story, except to say that if you're ever out in California and you meet a mountain lion and all else fails, you might just want to ask him if he's a Christian. <laughs> that was Bill Lepp with the Ojai Mountain Lion. Thanks for joining us today on The Appleseed, and thanks to Ed Stivender and Bill Lepp for sharing their stories. Listening to these stories always brings up memories for me that I love to share. Where do the stories take you, and who will you take along? Our episode today was produced by Brian Tanner and Heather Bigley. Our audio engineer is Carly Wilson. Trent Horton, Natalia Reeve, Hannah Harlan, and Evie Hendricks make up the rest of the Appleseed team. If you want to send us a note, you can email us at theappleseed at byu.edu. That's theappleseed, all one word, at byu.edu. Or if you're listening through a podcast app, Rate us. Leave us a little review. It helps people find the show. We're pleased and proud to be among the many shows in the BYU Radio family of programs. And you can find this episode or any episode from our archive on the BYU Radio app at byuradio.org slash Appleseed or by Googling the Appleseed podcast. I'm Sam Payne, and I can't wait to be with you again on the Appleseed. Appleseed.